Good morning from a freezing studio in New York. I'm Chris Hayes. Here with me are Josh Barrow from Bloomberg View, Michelle Goldberg of Newsweek and the Daily Beast, Heather McGee from the Demos Think Tank, and Neil Borowski, author of Bailout, an inside account of how Washington abandoned Main Street while rescuing Wall Street. Um, right before we get to the break, I want to talk about housing policy. And housing policy is one of those things where if someone says, I want to talk to you about housing policy, you're like, uh, uh. But housing policy is super important because, of course, it was housing policy and the housing market that got us into the crisis. And um, what I want to kind of lay out for people, and then I want to get your thoughts on what could have been done, is that the, you know we are in what economists call a balance sheet recession, right? And a balance sheet recession is where you just have too much debt hanging around, and that debt is a burden that kind of hangs around the neck of the economy and no one can quite get standing up upright because it is dragging them down. It's like walking around in one of those suits, right, that like weigh a lot of money, weigh a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's a sort of that's apt, a and, that's an apt mixed metaphor. Um, and I, I want to give you just some statistics on where we are in terms of housing, right? We all agree, housing bubble, people took on too much debt. So take a look at what total home mortgage debt was in 2008. It was $11 trillion, okay, um, total home mortgage debt. It, it is now essentially $10.2 trillion. It has not reduced by that much. Um, in fact, it's, it's, it's remained at incredibly elevated levels historically. And one of the parts of TARP was to go after this homeowner debt, this excessive homeowner debt, and lift that burden from the American uh, homeowner so that they could be functioning parts of the American economy again, essentially, was, was the logic. And that has just failed to happen. This is less than 10% of TARP funding for housing support programs has been sent. Less than 10%. So there's $45.6 billion allocated for housing support programs. Allocated. No one had to go back to Congress to get a vote. There was no you know, 60th vote in the filibuster, right? It was there to be spent. Only $4.5 billion was spent. Less than a third of projected beneficiaries of Home Affordable Mortgage Program, that's HAMP, which was one of the main programs out of TARP to do this, have received assistance. So in 2009, the administration says, we imagine three to four million homeowners are going to receive mortgage relief. It's less than a million as of May 2012. Why did this happen? How did this happen? It was a series of conscious choices that were made. Um, it, it's just that simple. They decided that this program, which was supposed to help struggling homeowners, as you said, up to four million, uh, was really going to be about assisting the banks. And and this was this you know talk about this in the book. In in in, in late '09, we had a meeting, an uh, oversight meeting. Elizabeth Warren, who was at the time chair of the Congressional Oversight Panel, and confronting Geithner on the very clear failures of this program, how it was not coming close to meeting its obligations because of conflicts of interest that Treasury put into the program, it gave the banks incentives not to modify people's mortgages to keep them in their homes, but to string them out, lit, rank up fees, and then throw them on the foreclosure scrap heap. And when it was confronted, Geithner defended the program by saying that it was going to, quote unquote, foam the runway for the banks. And he explained what, what by that, the banks could handle a certain number of foreclosures over a certain period of time, but any more than that, it may tip them back over. And that's what this program was about. It wasn't about keeping homeowners in their homes, it was about protecting the giant banks so they wouldn't need more TARP money. That, that the, the, the other phrase I've used to describe the policy is extend and pretend, right? That if all the foreclosures get, get uh, processed at the same time, the banks suddenly become insolvent again. But if you could span it out over a certain amount of time, then they can kind of coast along. Better. It was never about the homeowners. It was always about the balance sheet of the banks. And I want to make sure that we don't make the same mistake when we talk about the financial crisis. It was about not so much the housing bubble, but yes, the housing market, but the housing market as in my home being used as a casino chip. Right. I think we need to be very clear that what caused the banks to do a run on the banks was their derivative trading right. of these things that were tethered at some point to mortgages, right. but actually it wasn't about people being put into homes that they couldn't afford. That was not what has caused the global financial crash. Right. But I think what is an obstacle to, to the recovery is the, is household Absolutely. leverage. So the Absolutely. problem now is the household balance sheet. I mean, the, well, bank, ba the bank's balance sheets are fine. Right. <laughs> that's not the well, thing that's, that's the obstacle to recovery right now. The bank's balance sheets are fine if you believe their claims about what their roles are. <laughs> right, right, this is the right. extended pretend problem. Right. It allows you to overstate the, and so I think it's, you know, it is a real concern that if you force the banks to recognize the, the decline in the value of their loan portfolios, they can become insolvent again, and that requires more government support. But the, the, the point of which I think is that 
a mortgage modification program, however you structure it, costs money, mm -hmm. and someone has to pay for okay. that, and I think that's why there's resistance to so it. Right. Yeah. said, who's yeah. money? But, that, right. but the point is that that's what TARP was supposed right. to do. Congress yep. doesn't pass TARP without the promise for foreclosure relief, and not only do they have the $50 billion that they didn't spend, they had another $200 billion on top of that that was, again, authorized, could have been obligated, not a single vote of Congress, okay. all of which could have gone to this. But then you have what I will call the Rick Santelli problem, right, which is, and, you know, Rick Santelli of CNBC, the, the, the kind of iconic moment in which the Tea Party started was him ranting on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange about a piece of policy. I think it was the HAMP program, actually. It was a, it was a press was. conference about HAMP that was going to help homeowners and basically saying, your tax dollars are bailing out the losers, his mm -hmm. word, the losers who bought a house with a three bathrooms they couldn't afford. And so my question is, okay, let's say the, on the policy merits, you're right. They should have used that money to write down principal reductions, and we can talk about what that means, of homeowners, but the politics of it were so impossibly toxic that they would have they, they would have blown up if they did it. I'm sorry, but the cowardice in front of political opposition by Rick Santelli should not be <laughs> what a president is elected to do and what a treasury secretary is supposed to do when they take their oath of office. I mean, they had an obligation to the American people, and they had an obligation to Congress when they took this money to bail out the banks. And part of that was a meaningful homeowner policy. And frankly, the fact that they were going to be scared by Rick Santelli, and that's the reason why they spend only three to four billion dollars out of 50 or 200 available, um, the fact that we still have an anemic recovery in part well, because of these continuing problems, I mean, that's cowardice, not leadership. Well, but uh, I don't want to straw man. It's not Rick Santelli, right? It's that he represents some genuine revulsion, the moral, hazard, on, the moral hazard, and genuine re political revulsion on the part of people if they are being told. Remember, Barack Obama's already cutting your Medicare to give it some some other folks through his Affordable Care Act. Now he's taking your tax dollars to bail out these homeowners. But, maybe, that are, but, but, but I mean, maybe the question isn't just about the politics of it. It's kind of how should somebody like Geithner have addressed the moral hazard argument? Well, exactly as he did with the big banks. And you know, where's the revulsion of the moral hazard of? of, of of putting hundreds of billions of dollars. Again, there was no governor on the accelerating pedal when it came to shoveling money into the banks to save them. And the, the explanation was given. Uh, Barney You're Frank using governor government. in the official engineering sense. <laughs> yes. Not, not in the man elected. Yeah. The governor is actually the thing that modulates right. whether you get like, it. There was, no, there was no reluctance and no concern about the incredible moral hazard. Moral hazard that had destroyed the economy uh, and triggered the financial crisis and will trigger the next one because we haven't dealt with it. No concern at all. And, and they went out and they explained it and they say they called it collateral benefit. Um, um, those exact same principles should have been in play when dealing with the housing crisis because it's just as much a macroeconomic problem as, as, the, as the financial crisis for the banks were. So let's talk about principal reductions. Um, you got a mortgage, it's, it's uh, more than you can afford, let's say. Um, there's two ways of going about worth. dealing with that. More than your house is worth, you're underwater. You can refinance, right, which is, you know, bring your interest payment from, you know, let's say you got it at 7% because you had an adjustable rate mortgage, teaser rate went up, bring it down to say 4%, you know, mass refinancing. But that doesn't get rid of the principal problem, right? Which is that you owe, you, you owe more than the home is worth. I'm in favor of principal reductions. Heather, I think you're in favor of principal reductions. I think Josh, you're probably in favor yes. of pr principal yeah. reductions. Michelle, I don't know where you stand on principal <laughs> reductions. But this is something that even you know Glenn Hubbard has written about. He's a conservative economist who's advising Mitt Romney. Principal reductions. Marty Feldstein. Yeah, Marty Feldstein. I mean, principal reductions. Um, have not happened. Here is Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner testifying against principal reductions in December of 2009. This program was not designed, and this is a conscious choice we made, not to start with deep principal reduction. And we made that choice because we thought it would be dramatically more expensive for the American taxpayer, harder to justify, create much greater risk of unfairness. Um, that's, that's giving the case against principal reductions. Now, here is a letter from one and the same Timothy Geithner, dated this year, July 31st. And he's writing to the person who's overseeing the essentially now govern, fully government-owned entities of Fannie and Freddie, right? The government-sponsored enterprises, which went bust, had to be bailed out with taxpayer money, are now overseen by a guy named Edward DeMarco, who is running them as a sort of guarantor would in a bankruptcy proceeding, saying, you own a ton of these mortgages that are problematic. You should do principal reductions. You own them. And this is him making the argument. In view of the clear benefits that the use of principal reduction by Fannie and Freddie would have for homeowners, the housing market and taxpayers, I urge you to reconsider this decision. Five years in the housing crisis, millions of homeowners are still struggling to stay in their homes, and the legacy of the crisis continues to weigh on the market. Very true. 
You have the power to help more struggling homeowners and heal the remaining damage from the housing crisis. What changed? Did he just read your book? And even though he's mad, bro, at you, um, he, he decided to change his mind. Yeah, those words that he said are the exact same words that I advanced to Treasury over and over again, um, not, just, not just in 2009, but in 2010 and 2011. And, and no, he hasn't. This is, I mean, this is hypocrisy at its worst, because at the same time that he's telling Ed DeMarco that Fannie and Freddie have to have mandatory principal reduction in certain circumstances using these TARP funds, they're still refusing to do it themselves. In their own program, a recommendation I made back in 2010, one of those recommendations that Tim Geithner apparently had forgotten about when he was on Charlie Rose, I said, do this for your own program, and he still refuses to do this. This is just political posturing at its worst. They know DeMarco's going to say no. He's been saying no for six or seven months right now. Which is a problem. I mean, we should... No, no, and I, I agree with Geithner on this, and right. I think that DeMarco should be doing this, um, but they could have gotten rid of DeMarco six or seven months ago. They could have recessed the point in him at the same time that they did Cordray. They like having him so they can make give this image that now suddenly they're pro-homeowner in the hope that everyone will forget the history of the last couple of years. I want to ask you about what you learned in your time in Washington because the book is really interesting from that perspective um, and, and, and hear your sort of thoughts on the culture of the